Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this first event of the Governing Sustainable Municipalities Project Public Lecture Series. My name is Keith Comstock, and I am a, I'm an executive in residence at the Johnson Choyama Graduate School of Public Policy at the University of Regina. I'm uh, pleased to be here this evening to be the moderator for this session, and I just have a few opening remarks before I turn it over to our, to our guest star for the evening. I want, to, want you to note that this lecture is being recorded so that we can use it in the future and that, uh, and that it'll be there for posterity. And uh, I have a couple of email addresses. If you have a pen handy, I will give them to you in a moment or two. It's the, it's the email addresses that we want you to use if you have any technical difficulties or if you have a question for us this evening. We're talking about sustainability this evening, and that's a topic that is gradually becoming more familiar to the municipal sector, and the Governing Sustainable Municipalities Project is all about furthering and enabling that conversation. We all, of course, want our communities and our municipalities to be successful and sustainable over the long term. But that is easier said than done in many occasions in the real world. Communities are, of course, at different stages in this work, but overall, the we, we really need to get a better handle on where we're at as a province and as a sector. And more importantly, we need to have a, a serious discussion about what's next for us on the horizon. The Governing Sustainable Municipalities Project is funded by the Government of Canada's Future Skills Centre. And the project is really all about supporting Saskatchewan municipalities in defining and advancing their sustainability objectives. The GSM project pays specific attention to identifying barriers to change and opportunities for municipalities to move forward, whether that's in the area of infrastructure, governance, legislation and regulation, or policy, or whatever else that the sector tells us is important. We really hope that this project will help us to foster some communities of practice and initiate some excellent and in-depth conversations about the issue of sustainability in Saskatchewan. Quite frankly, one of the other side objectives of this, given my background in the municipal sector, is to be able to shine a bit of a spotlight on many of the good sustainability practices and projects that are already taking place across our province. And we also absolutely need to uh, give some serious consideration to skills training, some labour market dimensions around sustainability. We want to give some attention to issues of equity, diversity and inclusion, and planning to engage underserved groups in our communities. The Johnson Shyama Graduate School of Public Policy is a joint provincial school located at both the University of Saskatchewan and the University of Regina. JSGS is one of Canada's leading policy schools for educating graduate students and public servants interested and devoted to advancing public value. Before we get on to the main event, I want to acknowledge that while today's event is taking place online, JSGS's physical homes are located on Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 territories, the original lands of the Cree, Ojibwe, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and the traditional homeland of the Métis. We are glad to welcome you, those of you joining us today from across Turtle Island, and we make this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory we reside on or are visiting. Now, earlier on, I spoke to a couple of email addresses that you may want to just take note of. If you have any technical issues during tonight's presentation, drop us a note at jsgs.events at uregina.ca. You can see it on the bottom of your screen there. And if you have any questions or comments, we, we really do want to hear from you this evening. So please submit your comments and questions to gsm at usask.ca and we'll be happy to try and address as many of your questions and comments as we can at the end of the presentation. That concludes my opening remarks. On now to the main event. Dr. Margot Hurlbert is a faculty member of the JSGS Graduate School of Public Policy. She explores this evening the gap between what is needed to address climate change and the current policy and behaviour that we see experiencing not only across our province but generally across Canada. She is a professor and the Canada Research Chair, Climate Change, Energy and Sustainability Policy at the University of Regina. Please join me in giving a virtual welcome to Dr. Margot Hurlbert. Thank you. Um, and welcome to my lecture on resilience, innovation, and the changing risk landscape, 
here in Saskatchewan. I'm going to speak to you today in my capacity as a Canada Research Chair, but also in my capacity having worked with the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, the IPCC, and some of the recent reports that have come out in the sixth assessment report, or AR6. So if you could bring up my slides, please, that would be great. So my presentation is on innovation in a changing risk landscape. So I'm going to talk a lot around climate change risk and future of climate change and what it means for our province and for our municipalities. I really do want to focus on how risk can be an opportunity. So I acknowledge here that I'm on Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 territory. I live and work in Regina, Saskatchewan, uh, Treaty 4, and I was born in Canistino, Saskatchewan, Treaty 6, just at the outskirts of the James Smith Cree Nation. And I think in all of our work and our presentations, we need to think about how reconciliation can fit into our daily and weekly our research agendas into the future and not lose sight of that and what it means in the discussion around resilience. So today I'm going to talk a lot about climate change impacts and what the IPCC most recently released synthesis report just uh, this past Monday is saying about the climate that we're experiencing now and the climate we're facing into the future. I'm also going to speak about uh, how municipalities uh, need to be adapting and thinking about and could be thinking about the opportunities that this brings uh, with it. Um, I'll talk a bit about policy landscape, both at the international, federal, provincial and municipal level and what the policy landscape looks like and some of the gaps uh, that I see in the current situation and then the opportunities and some of the decisions that we have to make. So the climate is warming and I love this picture uh, that says this earth is getting hotter than my imaginary boyfriend and I think Thinking about climate change with a bit of humor helps us alleviate uh, some of the very dire messaging that is coming out and surrounding climate change. We're currently living in a world of 1.1 degrees Celsius warming from the industrial age of climate 150 years ago. And we're actually warming twice as fast as the Canadian rate of warming here in Saskatchewan. So we are in a microcosm of climate warming here in our northern hemisphere. So we have to keep this in mind when we think about the Paris commitments, which were made several years ago to keep global warming well below two degrees approaching 1.5 because we're actually already at 1.1 and we will cross that 1.5 degree warming uh, threshold in the 2030s that are coming up. So climate change and addressing climate change is becoming very urgent for maintaining and achieving sustainability. So in 2021, the assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change issued a red flag warning for humanity, stating that we needed immediately to reduce our emissions. And the synthesis that just came out this past Monday identifies that we need to cut our emissions, our greenhouse gas emissions, by 60% immediately and by 2035 achieve that 60% level if we're gonna have any ambition of achieving a target below two. So we've already surpassed our 1.5 target and to keep it below two, we need to cut emissions by 60% by 2035. And this is a conservative estimation. So when the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change publishes this data and this information that I'm showing to you, it's actually the result of a negotiation that happens in the 
IPCC, generally Geneva, Switzerland, but it could be somewhere else. And the nations come together and they ratify every clause and every statement in the summary for policymakers that is issued by the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. So everything that is said is not only agreed on by the scientists, but it's also agreed on by all the nation states. So it's actually a very conservative statement of where we are and what we need to do in order to address climate change, partly because of that negotiation process and also because the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change's findings are based on published, peer-reviewed scientific literature. And it takes anywhere from two to five years to get our scientific literature published in a peer review process. So we're always looking at literature that's been researched over two to five years ago. We're not looking at the most current research that has not yet been published. So there's always a bit of conservatism in the statements and estimates of the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. So the Working Group 3 came out with, no, this, sorry, this is Working Group 1 came out in 2021 with the climate change science and what we'd be looking at in various climate scenarios into the future. So what you're seeing here is that in a 1.5 warmer world, we're expecting to see droughts at two times the intensity and duration that we have seen them to date. So they're going to be two times worse in a 1.5 scenario. So this is if we can get a handle on climate change and keep it well below 2 to 1.5. So in 2021, that was still on the realm of possibilities. And here in 2023, with working group uh, 1, 2, and 3 synthesis, we actually know we can't make 1.5. So we're on a trajectory potentially to a 4 degree warming world. And on the risk factor equation, this means that our risk of drought is going to be about four times worse than the drought that we've been experiencing uh, in the recent past. We're also going to see heavier precipitation, excess moisture, which will re be resulting in floods, and a different snow regime where we're getting more moisture into the winter, uh, which will change our farming and our agricultural practices. I think you've noticed the new words that are coming at us. We're starting to talk about atmospheric rivers and we're starting to talk about heat domes. And these are things that are real and being experienced by municipalities and cities and increasingly are having to be planned for. And why do they have to be planned for? They have to be planned for because we're increasingly suffering catastrophic losses in Canada which this uh, data synthesis shows you has been increasing over the past years, sometimes to a great extent, but generally increasing in the last 10 and 15 years. And it's only going to get bigger. So we're going to have to make some decisions about our future because it is possible to keep global warming around two degrees Celsius, but it's also possible we're on a trajectory of four or greater with these increasing risks of droughts and floods. And what we do know this slide is telling you is when our droughts and floods increase exponentially under a four degree Celsius frame, uh, scenario, it means that those damages are going to be exponentially higher. So as we increase in our global warming scenarios and our trajectory along which we are proceeding, we're increasing our vulnerability and we're increasing our inequality, which is something the IPCC uh, has been talking about. So as an example of increasing vulnerability and inequality, when a flood occurs, a person like myself who owns a home and has house insurance I'm generally paid through my insurance or through disaster assistance and I weather the storm, I don't lose my job, but for someone who's in a more fragile situation, when a flood occurs, they're renting an apartment and they lose the contents of their apartment, they may lose their apartment 
and they may lose their livelihood because it's closed down, as in the case of the floods that happened in Yorkton, Saskatchewan several years ago. So what my research team has been doing is putting together a timeline of the climate hazards that we have experienced in Saskatchewan, and you see this before you. We've experienced uh, extreme droughts in 2001 to 2003, which cost a lot of money to Saskatchewan in its gross domestic product. But we've also experienced flooding, we've experienced warming, and we've experienced drought in the last couple years that were perhaps overshadowed by the advent of COVID, but very real in our rural and our agricultural communities. Now what we're experiencing is something we're calling a whiplash, where we move between drought and flood at an increasing intensity and frequency. So one year we're having drought, and the very next year we're in a flood situation. And we're calling this the whiplash uh, event of switching between drought and flood. So in relation to climate change, we need to think about how we respond to these disasters, drought, flood, fire, extreme storms, and how we adapt to their increasing occurrence. But we also have to keep in mind that we need to be reducing our greenhouse gases because in relation to adaptation, one of our most important adaptations is going to be reducing greenhouse gases. So we ensure that we're on that scenario of achieving only two degrees warming, not upwards of four or five. So we need to address that adaptation gap, which is especially relevant and important for municipalities. So right now we're, we're not ready and it's increasingly important that we be ready. We do know in our science that every dollar spent proactively in resilient infrastructure and upgrades provides returns of event, event investment of up to $6 on future averted losses. So paying attention to our disaster risk response, but how we reduce disasters, prevent droughts before they actually become the socio-economic drought. So we're used to less water. How do we do this? And how do we do both drought and flood at the same time? Because generally we have plans around drought, whether it's crop insurance, plans around flood, which is a different set of insurance. And we often don't plan for that whiplash between one and the other, or think about synergies of planning both for drought and for risk at the same time. It has been done in the past. So the Diefenbaker Dam was actually an example of planning both for drought, the retention of water in the Diefenbaker Dam, but also for flood and the flood prevention that happens all downstream of the Diefenbaker Dam with that uh, infrastructure. So preventing risk is increasingly important and thinking about the changing risk landscape in light of climate change is uh, important for resilience of our, of our communities, but also for managing our risks that are becoming ever more broader in terms of transitional risks, transitioning to that net zero future, for thinking about stranded assets for infrastructure that we've built that is no longer functional in our changing climate, and for thinking about changing financial risks as our liquidity, our operating, our underwriting risks change in light of increasing expenses of drought and flood uh, and increasing uh, loss of assets that have become stranded. So thinking about the joined up nature of these risks and how they ubiquitously link through many of our municipal planning strategies, budgets, and initiatives becomes ever more important. We also have changing migration, changing conflicts, and supply chain uh, changes that are occurring. So our multi-bread basket uh, failure results from in El Nino and La Nina, our ENSO or our linkage between South America, Central America and North America where because of those weather patterns we experience droughts all at the same time which impacts our food supply and potentially impacts the 
world food uh, bread basket uh, supply system when we start looking at a global level at climate change and the impacts uh, that we'll increasingly face uh, with drought. So that bar of expectation is increasing and it's important for us as municipal planners and people living in our communities not to keep our head in the sand, not to allow ourselves not to think about these changing risk dynamic and what we need to embrace that change and get ready for it. And we're getting pressure increasingly from different entities. We're getting it from governments, whether it's our federal government or perhaps our provincial government. We're getting it from regulators. The international standards organizations are increasingly uh, providing differing standards based on climate change modeling. Our residents and our ratepayers are increasingly demanding that we address whether it's our mitigation and our reduction of carbon in our heating and our buildings. Our businesses uh, are engaging on the topic and worried about their financial future in our, our cities and our municipalities and of course our customers and very least uh, the threat of litigation in the event that we fail to do the appropriate planning. So governments and regulators are increasingly being obligated to consider and provide climate disclosure. And this is something that has rippled from Mark Carney and some of his, he used to be the uh, Bank of Canada governor, moved to the Bank of England and started up financial disclosure for banks, companies, uh, any entity that uh, is basically putting together a balance sheet and what the requirements or expectations of these entities should be in the face of that omnipresent risk of climate change. So what you see on this slide that I won't read in detail is that the impact on our institutions is going to be so great from this changing weather and climate impacts that it's important that consideration of these impacts be ingrained in our strategy, in our budgeting, in our planning, and in our preparation in all contexts. So the Canada Expert Panel on Sustainable Finance actually presented recommendations that every se sector, including the municipal sector, should plan in the context of climate change, both for the impacts, for the obligations, and for the mitigation that's going to be happening. And in the context of the municipalities, this obligation and incentive is also included in the businesses and the uh, economy of the municipality and how that is changing in this changing risk landscape of climate change. So litigation is commencing and uh, for the working group two and the working group one of the intergovernmental panel for climate change, I looked at all of the litigation that's happening around the world in respect of, of climate change and a lot of it's happening and much of it has been happening unsuccessfully. But what we found from amassing the literature that's been put together on this litigation is that even when a lawsuit fails and it does not ultimately succeed, the behavior of the countries, the governments, and the businesses that have been sued actually changes as a result of that litigation. And it's important to think about that because it's changing the context of how we do business and our expectations. So just last week, Greta Thunberg, whom you may know as a climate activist from Sweden, successfully launched a climate lawsuit against the Swedish government for failure to take into account her generation's interests in their decision making in the context of climate change. There have been successful lawsuits as well in Amsterdam and many of the European courts and Australia. And as you can see from this map, the, a lot of the litigation that's occurring 
is in North America, Europe, and uh, South America, as well as some in South America. And this is changing the landscape because many of our businesses are international, doing business in all of these areas and considering changes elsewhere and having to change their own business practice. And this normative change of planning for climate change trickles down through these international businesses, these foreign governments, to change the lay of the landscape in relation to international norms, behavior, and soft law, which has implications for Canada and our municipalities and businesses uh, here. So people are winning. There have been some epic lawsuits against uh, companies, especially some oil and gas companies, interestingly, for failure to adapt or plan in relation to climate change, in relation to their own facilities. We also see lawsuits proceeding against companies for failure to take into account the future in the context of climate change to the detriment of their shareholders. And of course, failure of municipal government to plan for climate change impacts, which are then resulting in injury damage to their residents' uh, municipality. Okay. So ultimately, uh, it is required that we ask the right questions as we are making decisions, uh, writing strategy, and preparing plans in relation to climate change. So does the municipality have a climate change strategy? We've moved from uh, looking at whether municipalities have a disaster risk response for flood, fire, and uh, for drought. Some municipalities do, and some municipalities don't. Do municipalities have a climate change strategy in relation to adaptation, changing culvert size based on these bigger uh, rain events? Do they have a mitigation strategy for achieving some of these upcoming targets of reducing emissions by 60% by 2030? Have they considered this in their planning and their strategy? Are these strategies reviewed annually? Are they informed by climate change science and the scenarios and the possible futures that are coming at us? What is the depth and breadth of these uh, plans and strategies? And in all decisions and investments, have the climate change implications been taken into account in order to show that decisions have been made have been made with proper information and uh, with due care and attention to pass that legal liability standard. Have municipalities considered the increasing price of carbon in their uh, calculations and in their decisions and planning? So those are some of the questions that we need to ask. Are municipalities aligned with the federal goal that's coming out of reducing emissions below 2005 levels by 40 to 45% by 2030? Are they aligned with phasing out some of our worst carbon emitting uh, ac activities and um, activities and carbon emitting practices or are they making decisions about replacement of equipment or infrastructure based on old models or short-term thinking? So building a resilient strategy with scenario analysis is increasingly becoming what's required in order to build a resilient plan into the future. And in order to do that, uh, what we need to think about are the climate change scenarios that are facing us that um, could be as high as five degrees or could be lower to two degrees. So having considered all of these plans into the future and how they impact our infrastructure, our schools, and our finances, our business taxes into the future are all something that will have to be considered. So that policy changing risk landscape, starting with the federal jurisdiction, 
uh, is important to think about. And we can see in this slide that increasingly the federal government has been passing legislation uh, and increasingly, if, even in this current budget that the federal government will be announcing, it has implications both from a regulatory and a legal landscape, but also opportunities for our local municipal governments and our sectors of business and agriculture, uh, which depend on uh, our municipal and our communities for support. There's some conflicting policy goals and agendas, but no longer do we have the, uh, the ability to put our head in the sand and think that we are immune to having to negotiate these conflicts and these realities and not have to plan for a Canadian and international and this future that lawsuits might be uh, opening up to us. So we know that there's some conflicting policy goals and agendas. With Saskatchewan, we have a great resilience plan with some indicators that have started the discussion, but we are not so much on our trajectory of reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, because as you know, Saskatchewan has the highest per capita greenhouse gas emissions in Canada. So even though the provinces lost their carbon tax challenge, we still are trying this argument with a uh, sovereignty uh, act that is proceeding and will probably be proceeding through uh, the courts. So we're receiving mixed singles, but we can't not face the reality of planning for climate change and the potential that we have uh, to face in reduction of our greenhouse gases. So Saskatchewan, as I mentioned, has a great resilience plan and it has some great potential in it. It has some growth plan, which again has some potential in it to make our communities more resilient and prosperous. But we have to be thinking about what is inconsistent in relation to addressing the omnipresent risk of climate change and whether uh, some of the statements about increasing our production of oil and gas by 600,000 barrels uh, per year is something that is in line with the reality of climate change and where we need to be. So we really have uh, no more room for denial. And I've heard this from many of the focus groups and citizen juries that have conducted over the past couple years that the, they expect from their governments no more room for denial, but to actually embrace uh, planning for climate change. And this uh, excerpt from uh, a comedian saying global warming isn't real because I was cold today just is so reminiscent of much of what I've heard from some Saskatchewan residents over the last 25 years of researching in this area. And also great news, world hunger is over because I just ate is somewhat the same uh, logic. So I'm starting to run out of time for our great lecture tonight. So I want to finish with some opportunities and different ways of thinking about climate change into the future. Uh, there's many opportunities that I've found people are not always aware of that uh, they could be, that is opportunities for business, whether it's uh, through accessing particular funding pots that you see on this slide, um, accessing different markets, and thinking about how that risk and changing landscape actually opens up the room for possibilities into the future. And converting those risks into uh, bigger opportunities. So clean technology is something that Saskatchewan and southern Saskatchewan especially has done in spades. We were the first uh, post-power production combustion carbon capture sequestration plant at Boundary Dam power station in 2015 and that was an international first that Saskatchewan should be proud of and in the climate change scenarios in order to keep global warming well below two degrees every single scenario plans for negative emission technologies such as carbon capture and sequestration 
or taking the carbon out of the air and putting it into deep geological storage, uh, which has been happening near our communities uh, in Estevan and Weyburn for many years now. And this is something that's really important and we shouldn't lose uh, sight of. And it's potentially a missed opportunity in which Alberta is way ahead of us with some of their carbon pipelines that they're building and their carbon utilization uh, subsidies and business opportunities in, in that uh, province uh, that are ongoing. So we need to be thinking about that and what the tipping points of change might be for the future. So I didn't talk about the tipping points of risk with our changing um, greenhouse gases and our melting ice and Arctic, our permafrost, those are the tipping points of risk that we often talk about in relation to climate change. But we're also starting to see tipping points of opportunity. And electric vehicles are one of these, where the prices are actually starting to be uh, very, very um, good. And in fact, it's more opportunistic to own an electric vehicle with less greenhouse gas emissions and given the price of fuel, less costs in uh, Canada. And there will be a tipping point with the federal legislation that is bringing in electric vehicles where there will be more electric vehicles. But what will this do to our power grid in Saskatchewan? Because it's going to almost double our requirement for electricity. And that electricity will have to be zero emissions. So that means that natural gas without carbon capture and sequestration is going to be a stranded asset. We're going to need more wind, more solar, a lot more of it, and potentially nuclear and more hydroelectricity if we can possibly, possibly build it or bring it in from elsewhere. So we're going to have to keep these opportunities center of mind as municipalities having to plan for electric vehicles in relation to our roads, our charging stations, and our accessibility for everyone in the community, not just the upper middle class people who are the ones right now who are owning electric vehicles. Um, I'm showing you some work from the tipping points out of the University of Sheffield and Exeter in the United Kingdom, but they have application here. I was working with this group last fall, and they're really interested, starting with electric vehicles, what are the opportunities? And Canada and Saskatchewan is considering these with mining and uh, minerals and components that we need to make the batteries, not only for electric vehicles, but for battery storage for our power production. And there's also synergies you'll see on this summation table that they put together between green hydrogen and green ammonia for fertilizer. And these are the ways that our agriculture and our energy practices are changing into the future and the Saskatchewan economy and business is changing. So how as municipalities do we actually accommodate these, this changing landscape and these opportunities and not miss out? So the synthesis report of the IPCC also ends with numerous opportunities and tries to bring our attention to the synergies and the opportunities that are co-opportunities that mean if I reduce uh, greenhouse gases, I'm also adapting. If I do one thing in planning for flood, I'm also planning for drought. And some really interesting ideas are coming out uh, in other communities and in communities around Saskatchewan too. So part of our project is to identify those opportunities and build upon them in this research. So I'm showing you a picture of a sponge city and this is an idea that came out from living with constant threat and reality of flooding. So if we're going to do so, we're going to actually have to accept that we're going to flood every few years because this is our new climate and reality. So how do we think of ourselves as a sponge city that can absorb all that excess water and, and use it and live with it uh, into the future uh, in, with the infrastructure that we have then the infrastructure that we can afford. Now I'm going to show to you a picture of something that was also built, but it was built for a community faced with drought. 
And it's about rainwater harvesting and how, in times of drought, what communities are doing is capturing the water on their roofs and they're storing it in the ground and in areas so that they can use it because of aridity and water scarcity. But I challenge you to look at the synergies that exist between what I just showed you with communities that are planning for flood and this picture of communities that are planning for drought. And it's about capturing that water that we have and storing it in a place that we can use it and retain its value into the future and perhaps weather out the storm of drought and flood in a less variable manner into the future. And if we combine that with the movements that's happening for urban agriculture and creating green spaces that actually address that heat dome that I was speaking about, cities are building green spaces that reduce the temperature in their concrete, lower middle income apartment complexes where people are suffering inordinately from those heat domes and they're doing it by creating green spaces which also can create agriculture and food and advance their food security. So those are three things that are actions into the future that municipalities are doing and all three of them are actually building resilience to drought, to flood and to increasing food prices and shortages. So I, I'm going to end there, and I just wanted to draw your attention to this great cartoon about, uh, well, what if climate change is a hoax, because I hear that so much, and we're just making our, our world a better future for everyone. And I'll end there. Thank you, Margo. I really appreciate your time. Uh, we have uh, a few questions that have come in to... Uh, into us uh, this evening through the email that I provided at the front end of our presentation. And what I've tried to do is I've taken a several of them and I've, I've kind of woven them together so that, so that hopefully we can, we can take advantage of uh, being able to answer a number of questions at the same time. So here is the, pre is the preface. Municipalities have a very well-defined and, and a legislated set of responsibilities right now. Uh, they can't and won't drop everything else that they are doing and devote all of their energies to sustainability issues uh, because it's just not practical. One of the things that the Saskatchewan's municipal sector has always prided itself on is being able to take action that is sensitive to their own needs, to the situation and the size of their community. So when we talk about resiliency, for example, what does that mean? from the municipal sector's perspective and what might be a couple of really logical first steps for councils to take at the local level to think about some of the issues that you brought up tonight to see if there's anything that they need to do or that they might want to do to protect uh, not only their infrastructure but also the future of their communities. Yeah, thanks for that. And uh, thinking about climate change is sometimes overwhelming, but what I found from working on the issue of governance for resilience is starting in small steps. And droughts and floods and disaster risk reduction is something municipalities do now. They know that they have the potential for flood and cities like Yorkton have been flooded recently and they build those plans. And resilience, really academically we could talk about this for for a long time but in the academic literature it's building back to what we have building generally so that we can suffer a flood and very easily address any damages and any losses to people so that we are the same at the end of the flood but what we know from climate change that that cities and municipalities have to start preparing and thinking about is that it often is a, a, a money loser to build back to the same one in 10 flood standard or one in 100 or one in 200 flood standard because those standards actually have changed. So when I was talking about floods and droughts being two to four more times uh, occurring two to four more times in the future, that has actually changed that, that level of drought, the one in 100, to being something that's one in 10. So we, that's probably where, for busy municipalities, uh, a place to start, is considering 
what we have built our flood zone protection uh, to and whether it's changed in light of this climate change science and whether any changes are needed in our municipal disaster responses and planning in that event. You make an excellent point about municipalities have responsibility for land use planning and zoning. They have uh, bylaw making authority and taxing authority and they own uh, some, somewhere around 60% of the public infrastructure in Canada is owned by the municipal level. So there is a, there is a, huge, uh, a, a huge burden that could be placed on the municipal sector. And I have another question for you. Um, many people note that the relatively small proportion of the greenhouse gas burden uh, that Canada represents in the world, something uh, approaching 1% of, of, what the real, of what the big problem is. What do we say to those people who note that even if Canada's CO and greenhouse gas emissions were zero, we'd not even make a dent in the world's problems. How do we get, uh, how, do you, how do you reconcile that reality with the need for us to still do things that protect our community? Mm -hmm. Yeah, th that's a justice and an equity uh, um, discussion, uh, which I, I see as different from protection of our community against these ever-increasing impacts, right? So working at the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, almost every country can make a justice equity. So countries that are developing countries that have not emitted greenhouse gas emissions at all uh, or very little have increasingly arguments that they did not cause this problem and they are suffering increasingly the damages. And at a small island, it, a small island would be an example. They're increasingly inundated. Many of them are going to have to leave their islands because of flooding and sea level rise. So they actually didn't contribute to those greenhouse gases at all and they're the ones that are suffering. So everyone has that, that, uh, that victim or poor me claim. So at a certain point uh, the argument becomes well what is the world that you're leaving for your, your children and your next generation if we're, if we're going to talk about it from a, a justice perspective. Also because it has become so dire, there is no, not even the developing countries, not Saskatchewan because we're such a small component of world emissions, no one is going to be immune and be able to emit emissions because they're a small amount. We are all contributing to that greenhouse gas emissions and therefore all have to be responsible for our current greenhouse gas emissions, but probably our past greenhouse gas emissions as well. So it's, it's going to really take uh, everyone at the table. And if we don't actually address our greenhouse gas emissions or ADAPT, we're actually missing not only all those opportunities that I spoke of, but potentially we're, we're liable because we are not addressing this, uh, this cat catastrophic risk uh, and um, damage that we face going into the future. So people and ratepayers, uh, me, uh, we're all rightfully concerned about, about the numbers and about costs and about what it means for us and, and our tax load and nobody wants to pay more. I don't think there's any, I've, in my 40 year career with the province, I don't think I ever had anybody ever write me an email or, or, send, or tell, call me on the phone and say, you know what, I, I, think I, I just think I'm not quite paying enough. I, I should be paying more. I would like my share to go up a little bit. So. Uh, with that as the backdrop, is there a way for us to start uh, thinking about how you flip the paradigm uh, and look at the opportunity to save as opposed to the opportunity to tax and to spend? Uh, I would just want to give one example as kind of a prelude to that not, uh, and then give you a chance to respond. Uh, a week and a half ago or so at the SARM convention, the uh, municipal uh, awards, innovation awards, were given out and uh, the winner of this year's award was the community of Lumsden. They have recently completed a project where they, uh, they, they moved their uh, water treatment plant and their waste water facility uh, to solar power. And uh, the, the numbers that they are projecting, uh, yes, there was a cost uh, up front, but over the course of the life of the project, they project that they will save their community between two and three million dollars over the life of that project. So I think to put people's minds at ease or to help us focus the conversation on something other than, you know, 
why we ought not to have to carry this burden on our own. Is there, where do we start with that conversation? And, and particularly from a municipal perspective, because those are the folks that are owning and operating these facilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that question. So uh, from my perspective, what I have seen in the research I do with municipalities around best water management practices or adapting or mitigating for climate change, it, it's exactly that. It's, it's, planning for a future, a future that changes with climate change and a future financial landscape that I tried to give some indication in my presentation was changing and in those changes to see the opportunities. But the city of Lums Lumsden, for instance, is seeing the opportunities of both mitigation, turning to solar power, as well as adapting with their wastewater treatment I didn't speak about water quality, but part of our research on uh, um, addressing the adaptation gap links both changes in drought and flood and changes happening in the South Saskatchewan River and the diversion into the Quipel chain and how that's impacting water quality. So a very important consideration and Lumsden has been very active in the discussions in the Quipel chain around water quality and the concerns of all of the communities in recreation, fishing, livelihoods and drinking water in the Quipel chain. So this is thinking about all of those uh, aspects and what is the most opportunistic pathway into the future and they you know hit all of the nails on the head with that decision and they should be recognized as they were for it. So for me this is all about municipalities that's my background that's my professional expertise and uh, and I, I prefer to concentrate on, you know, that which I can control as opposed to that which I cannot. But there was an interesting question that came in, and it was a bit of a, uh, a, a, bit of a world question. And it's about lithium mining and the raw materials that are going to be needed to continue with the developments to batteries and energy storage facilities uh, and, and the horrific conditions that we've all heard about. Um, I, I know that's not necessarily directly related to the subject of your, of your talk tonight, but I think it's a valid point that um, if we look to a single solution on this, we're going to fail. We need a, a diversity of thought and diversity of opinions and a diversity of actions. And um, uh, maybe just comment on the, on the mining issue and then on the need for some sort, you know, a, a bit of a, a, a smorgasbord, if you will, or a buffet of choices with respect to dealing with these issues. Yeah. No, thanks for that. So part of my work is adaptation to climate change in relation to water. And part of it is the mitigation side around how do we get to net zero and how do people and different sectors come together to achieve a net zero future uh, in, in whether it's 2030 or 2050. But what do their strategies look like? So when I talk to people about that future and they start thinking holistically let's take power production, which is a uh, low hanging fruit. They start asking questions about everything from electric vehicles and their reliability and whether they can get from place to place. But what are the, what are the components that go into that battery and where do they come from? And is it just where they're being mined or are people being taken advantage of? So the discussions are fascinating. So everything from solar power and wind power, where the turbines are made, where the solar panels are made, whether they're recycled, they want to know the cradle to grave supply chain and the cradle to grave costs when they start thinking about that future because they're concerned about that future. Um, they also want to know all of those questions uh, from nuclear and fascinating, but nuclear, the sector actually knows the answers to all those questions, whereas oftentimes other sectors don't know the answers. So I think we increasingly as researchers, scientists, uh, have to provide that information to make good decisions because they have to account for everything from A to Z into the future. And that's how we make good decisions. I have one question and then I have a comment. Uh, I'm going to let you answer the question and then I'm going to start wrapping this up because we're coming to the end of our time. We did a question, uh, and again, it's a bit of a science question, and uh, the, the person that asked the question is wondering about, uh, we, we all hear about climate change causing 
uh, you know, more droughts, more floods, extreme weather conditions. How does that work? How does it happen? <laughs> you, have, you have 30 seconds, 30 Stan. seconds for that, yes. How does that happen? Boy, yeah. So uh, climate change, climate is uh, what we anticipate and weather is what we get, right? So climate is kind of a 30-year 30, 30 perspective. But what we do know is is those atmospheric rivers, let's take that, we've got changing levels of moisture in the atmosphere that are changing our storms and our precipitation events because of that. But in other areas of the world we have because of this warming event and, and the soil is not holding moisture. So we see these changes that are occurring depending on uh, the weather patterns, those ENSOs uh, events, the La Nina and El Nina. So we have these great monitoring, whether it's NASA or our climatologists, they're monitoring the weather and they've documented the changes that have happened that I was speaking to. And then we have these great climate scenarios that predict the future. And because they've been doing this now for so many years, they can calibrate the future of those climate scenarios and they can actually fact check them that they predicted the future, but they also, when they run the models, explain the past. So we're calibrating the science around not only the future changing climate, but why the, the weather and the climate that we experienced in the past actually changed based on the greenhouse gas emissions that are in the atmosphere. I don't know if that was the scientific answer that you were looking in my plain l person's language, and I hope I, I provided a 30 second overview of that. Okay. Thanks, Margo. I'm going to give you an opportunity for one last uh, comment before we wrap up. But I just want to make sure that that we're all on the same page in terms of what the uh, of what it is that we're trying to accomplish here. We know, uh, we all know, not just us that are involved with the project, but people that live in this province know that uh, you know we're creative. Uh, we uh, we have a good deal of doubt about us. We look at everything with uh, uh, with a bit of a you know we want to make sure we're doing the right thing at the right time. And we're just starting this conversation about sustainability from a municipal perspective. And even though climate change is part of it, it's not the only part of it. And I would say at this point in our history, it's probably not even the most important part from a, muni from a strictly municipal perspective. I think there's some policy issues around planning, around governance, around the way we manage ourselves and, and the way that we operate our municipalities that we could, do, we could be doing a better job. So uh, that's one of the nice things about this project, that it's not fixated on just one aspect of sustainability throughout the course of the project. We're going to talk about a variety of, of, the, uh, of the implications that municipal councils have to take uh, notice of. And, and I hope at the end of the day that it's, that it's going to be a productive conversation. It's not going to be one where, where, we just, you know, where we just throw up our hands that we, you know, we can't do anything about the world, so we're not going to do anything. And it's not where we try to take on more than what we can. So we need to be practical about it. And I, and I hope everyone enters into the debate with that spirit in mind that we're, that we're looking at making our province and our planet a safer and, and more hospitable place for our grandchildren and our grandchildren's grandchildren. So, Margo, I'll leave the last word to you, and then I'll just say thank you to everyone and we'll sign off for this evening. Great. No, I think that's a great point because when we look at sustainability and different uh, contexts, whether it's energy or climate change, droughts or floods, they are so inter interconnected. So I don't know and I do know that it, I don't know what the particular uh, most important issue is for any particular community, but I do know that these issues are all interconnected. Thank you, everyone who joined us this evening. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed. We hope that it raised some questions in your mind. We hope that uh, it maybe uh, caused you to think a little bit differently about some of the aspects of sustainability that the municipal sector is going to have to wrestle with over the next uh, decade or two. And uh, we thank you very much for your time and your attention this evening. It was our pleasure to be here with you.